Thank you.
French, so um, I'm quite aware that both of my supervisors are French speaking, so I will do my best with pronunciation, but please give me some grace. Um, so what you just heard was Saint Georges Concerto, Opus 3, Number 1 in D major. Um, and that was one of many compositions that, that he wrote. What is known of the story of Joseph Boulogne, Chevalier Saint-Georges, is indeed incredible. The people he knew and influenced, and the name he made for himself, are almost unbelievable in their extraordinary nature. However, many of the details of his life have been lost, as well as several documents and music manuscripts that might have shed light on his history. Racism, prejudice towards foreigners, and the political climate of the day also meant the intentional spreading of gossip, whether based in fact or fiction. In addition, an 1840 novel about Saint-Georges invented all kinds of fanciful details, which were accepted as fact by many, until more recent research corrected the misconceptions. Last year, a new mainstream film about his life came out and also took creative license with the truth about his biography. In truth, Saint-Georges was one of the truly great spirits of the Enlightenment, both as a musician and a political figure. And his story fills in many gaps to expand our perspective beyond Western history because of his very identity. While there are many misconceptions about Saint-Georges, all sources agree on the following basic information. He was of French Creole descent, having been born in the colony of Guadeloupe to an enslaved woman and a wealthy plantation owning Frenchman. Upon moving with his mother to France, he excelled at all he undertook and became an exceptional violinist, composer, improviser, and conductor. He was equally famous as a champion fencer, hence the title Chevalier as well as a dancer, skater, rider, and hunter. And he was sought after in the company of the highest society in Paris and England. Saint-Georges was extremely well loved during his younger years for his talents, temperament, generosity, good looks, and sense of fashion. And he held many prestigious and important titles and positions during his lifetime. When people hear Saint George's music, they often think it sounds like Mozart and compare the two composers, assuming that Saint George must have been influenced by the Austrian musical genius. However, Mozart was actually 11 years younger than Saint George, who was already a famous and established musician by the time Mozart first came to Paris in 1763. While Mozart struggled to gain traction and make ends meet, the French-speaking Saint-Georges was popular with the nobility and had a handsome allowance from his father. Moreover, Saint-Georges' first violin concertos were written in 1773, and Mozart's violin concertos of 1775 show, according to some scholars, clear structural influence from Saint-Georges. The Parisian violinist was also able to perform his own concertos with incredible virtuosity especially in improvisation, not dissimilar to Mozart's abilities as a keyboardist. Incredibly, from July 5th until September 11th, 1778, both Mozart and Saint-Georges lived and dined in the house of Madame de Montesson, who was a patron of the arts. It is also very likely that being acquainted with the same people they would have encountered one another on Mozart's first visit to Paris in 1766. However, in Mozart's numerous letters, he never once mentions the Chevalier, although he often writes about composers in the same circles with considerably less talent and prestige than Saint-Georges. 
Even though Mozart's father encouraged him to seek a commission from Saint George's orchestra, and the two composers' names alternated on Paris concert announcements, there seems to be no evidence of their collaboration or camaraderie. This is strange, considering the tight-knit circles of French musical society. And Alan Guide, among others, has even speculated that it seems to point to a jealous rivalry between the two composers. Guede is also in the company of those who have theorized that the Moor, Monostatos, in Mozart's 1791 opera, The Magic Flute, was based on Saint Georges, as the character characterization depicts many of the racist stereotypes of black men that were prevalent at the time. If this was true, which seems very possible considering the lack of a record of congeniality between the two composers, despite their close proximity and mutual acquaintances, it did not stop Mozart from taking inspiration from the famous Saint Georges. The Chevalier was one of the composers who was celebrated in his popularization of the Sinfonia Concertante, which usually featured two soloists and prioritized their interaction and equal footing on stage. Rather like a fencing duel, interesting enough. Shortly after the two composers shared a living space and patron, Mozart wrote his beloved Sinfonia Concertante in E flat major for violin and viola. Curiously, or perhaps not so curiously, the piece exactly cites a line from Saint Georges' Opus 7, Opus 7, number 2 violin concerto of 1777, though in a different key. According to Gabriel Balat, it is not Viotti, Kreutzer, or Rode who initiated the modern French school, but rather Saint Georges, who, from a technical standpoint, introduced the kind of galant virtuosity present in this context. Banat writes, aside from their natural and appealing qualities, the significance of his concertos and symphonies concertantes is their role as a bridge, connecting the violin technique of the violinist composers of the late Baroque, such as Tartini and Locatelli, to the technique of the 19th century romantics. Saint George's particular virtuoso idiom leads directly to Beethoven and beyond. By bypassing the violinistically more restrained style of the Mannheim School and the great Austrian masters of classicism. Another theme, this one from Saint George's Violin Concerto, Opus 2, Number 2 of 1773 is directly quoted by Beethoven in his only violin concerto in D major, Opus 61 of 1806. And the piece shows a clear influence, especially from the kinds of bariolage bowing and virtuosic figuration typical of Saint Georges. This influence is also evident in Beethoven's triple concerto, Opus 56. Beethoven never met Saint Georges, but there is a fascinating circumstances which may have connected them. Beethoven had a close friendship with the violin prodigy and composer Franz Clement, whom Beethoven first saw in concert in 1794, when Clement was only 14 years old. Clement, who was later to commission the violin concerto from Beethoven and also to revise its technical passages, was a student of Giovanni Mane Ioannovici, who Saint Georges at one point felt forced to confront because he had been trying to pass off Saint Georges' concertos as his own. It is very likely that Ioannovici had taught these stolen concertos to his students. And according to Gabriel Banat, Clement undoubtedly included one of Saint Georges' concertos, the most difficult music in his repertoire in his initial performance for Beethoven. Indeed, Giornovici was also the teacher of George Polgreen Bridge Tower, a British violinist of Af African descent to whom Beethoven originally dedicated his Sonata No. 9, before he rededicated it to Kreutzer after a quarrel. Bridge Tower and Saint George would also have directly encountered one another in England in 1787 at the residence of the Prince of Wales, where Bridge Tower was a protege 
and Saint-Georges was a frequent guest. These immediate links between the music and influence of Saint-Georges and Beethoven explain some of the similarity found in their music. But how did Josef Ballone become such an accomplished violinist and composer in the first place? There are no concrete records of his violin study, although it is clear that upon arriving in Paris at age seven, he was given the best schooling that money could buy. Some people speculate that he studied with Jean-Marie Leclerc, who had largely founded the French school of violin and pioneered the violin concerto in France. Another possibility would have been Pierre Gavinier, but there is no actual evidence to support this claim. One person who is confirmed to have been of great influence and support to Saint-Georges is the composer Francois Joseph Gossick, founder and conductor of the 70-piece Concertes Amateur Orchestra. Gossick dedicated a set of trios to the younger Saint-Georges and in 1769 also invited him to play as part of the Concert des Amateurs, considered, considered a democratic ensemble because it was made of both nobility who were excellent at music and of professional musicians earning their living from their talents. By 1771, Saint-Georges had been promoted to concertmaster, and in 1773, Gossick handed over direction of the ensemble to the favored Saint-Georges. It was under this new direction that according to Almanac Musical in 1775, the Concert des Amateurs became the best orchestra for the symphonies there is in Paris, and perhaps Europe. The correspondence of Saint-Georges' association with the Concert des Amateurs and his output of violin concertos is worthy of note. The violinist composer often appeared as a soloist for the orchestra with his own highly virtuosic compositions that demonstrated his almost miraculous technical abilities. However, the Chevalier was not cavalier and his compositions and performance style were said to have been in service to the music. The cadences he improvised were not only impressive, but he also added programmatic elements evoking nature to his inventive interpretations, which his admirer, Louise Fussi, later compared to the music of Hector Berlioz. In her memoirs, she wrote, Saint-Georges possessed a musical sensitivity of the highest degree, and musical expression was his principal merit. In the performance of the concerto, you have just heard, I have tried in my own cadenzas to remain true to this bravado style. In composing them, I referred to Mozart's Sinfonia Concertante cadenzas, which are among the few from that era that have been written out instead of improvised in the moment. Some financial disasters on the part of the backers of the Concert des Amateurs influenced by important political events, threatened the orchestra with demise, late in 1780. But it was saved by affixing itself to a Masonic lodge and rebranded as Le Concert Olympique. With Saint-Georges still in charge, the orchestra continued with great success in its democratic structure. A newly negotiated contract with Esterhazy freed Joseph Haydn to accept private commissions and Count Diogny Grand Master of the Masonic Lodge Olympique commissioned what became known as the Paris Symphonies, which were premiered in 1786, with Saint-Georges conducting. Also influenced by the prolific Haydn, in 1773, Saint-Georges wrote some of the first French string quartets, and the four parts are quite equal in difficulty and in the way they feature in each instrument. This is rather surprising, considering Saint-Georges' exceptional abilities as a violinist, and the tradition of the first violin part usually being much more virtuosic than that of the other instruments. Likewise, his sonatas for violin and piano of 1781 are innovative in that the two instruments participate on equal terms, whereas previously, the violin had been listed ad limitum in keyboard sonatas from France. 
Perhaps these compositional practices were a foreshadowing of his valuation of equality that would become more and more significant in the coming years. Despite his acclaim, success, schooling, and positions of leadership, it would be wrong to suppose that Saint-Georges' experience was untarnished by racial, racial discrimination. In this way, his life was somewhat of a contradiction that shed light on the inconsistencies present in the culture of 18th century Europe. For example, Saint-Georges would have never been permitted to marry a white woman and he would have lost all standing in French society if he had married a woman of color. In addition, though it was clear that Saint-Georges' father loved Saint-Georges and his mother, and was estranged from his own wife and legitimate daughter, upon his father's death, Saint-Georges found the will altered and his inheritance awarded to his half-sister. Saint-Georges' musical career and humanist endeavors also received opposition due to his Creole ancestry. He was a subject of vicious gossip and was both attacked and imprisoned because of his heritage and associations. While organizations such as the Freemasons pursued liberal ideas and the French Revolution sought the liberty, equality, and fraternity of men, Saint-Georges still remained an outsider, ironically, both because of his race and because of his wealth and association with nobility. A man of extravagance, known for being extremely generous to his friends, Saint-Georges also appeared in a fresh set of clothes every day, something which was uncommon for the time period. He was purportedly, sorry, he was purported to be especially adored by the ladies. ladies and La Boissière made much of the fact that he loved and was loved. Love affairs in the circles of the nobility were common, and although generally kept secret, seemed to be an accepted part of the culture. It is thought that Saint-Georges entered readily into this custom, especially since he was not permitted to marry. However, he was also subjected to unfair gossip around this normalized enjoyment of French high society. It has been conjectured that he fathered an Ill illegitimate child with the Marquise de la Montalembert, an idea deduced because of a horrific attack on Saint-Georges by the French police that was organized by the Marquis, allegedly as an act of revenge. The memoirs of singer and actress Louise Foucy are rife with their admiration for the famous Saint-Georges, and the two are thought to have been much more than simply musical partners. Rumors also flew around about Saint-Georges and Madame de Montezon, who not only employed Saint-Georges as music director at her theater, but also provided him rooms at the ducal residence. Saint-Georges was often invited to frequent the salons of the wealthy nobility and to give private concerts, and was celebrated for his talents charm, and good looks. A notable figure in the world of Parisian salons was Elizabeth Louise Viguet Le Brun, and her chronicles provide many important details about high society Paris. She is, however, best known for her portraiture of Marie Antoinette, who was queen during this time. Marie Antoinette would appoint her to the Paris Royal Academy of Art in 1783 making her one of only four women to hold the honor. Her 1782 self-portrait is on the left of the slide. Le Brun's 1783 portrait of Marie Antoinette on the left was presented at one of Le Brun's salons and it caused such a scandal that it was taken down and replaced by the 1783 portrait on the right. For one thing, the queen's dress looked more like an undergarment than the proper garb for the ruling noble. For another, it was not made of the silk for which the French were so famous, but rather of cotton, 
which was associated with allegiance to Britain, as the valuable fabric was primarily exported from its colony in India and was actually outlawed in France. Marie Antoinette had also created a fanciful model farm or village for herself in Petit Trianon, where she played at country living while the actual farmers of France suffered. The dress was offensive in this way as well, as its nod to rustic simplicity romanticized the very difficult lives of the peasants. This increased the hatred towards the queen, who was already disliked because of her Austrian descent. Despite this, Marie Antoinette's tastes were broadly imitated, including trends in fashion and attire. Indeed, today, one might even call her a fashion influencer. Carolyn London speculates that this dress may have ignited the cotton slave trade, as it led to the widespread preference of cotton over silk for women's garments, which in turn led to high demand and its commodification. Saint-Georges became Marie Antoinette's friend and music teacher in 1774, and she in turn became one of his great supporters. It may well have been Le Brun who introduced the two at one of her salons. Having been raised in the Viennese Habsburg court, Marie Antoinette possessed finely developed musical tastes and played the keyboard and harp. Indeed, the two of them may have even bonded over their otherness. Marie Antoinette was too Austrian to be French and too French to be Austrian, and Saint-Georges did not truly fit into either the world of his mother or his father. They played duets together, which generated much gossip, with contemporary journalist, journalist Georges Touchard La Fosse recording with ripe sexual innu innuendo that Saint-Georges was making music with the Queen. It is impossible to say if there was any truth to it, but Saint-Georges did write his first opera about the story of Ernestine by Marie-Jean Ripoconi, a novel that Marie Antoinette apparently always kept by her bedside, which tells the story of forbidden love. Eventually, Saint-Georges was let go as Marie Antoinette's music teacher and was replaced by Christophe Willibald Gluck, who had taught Marie Antoinette in Vienna during her childhood. With its success with the Concert des Amateurs in 1774, Saint-Georges was also identified as the man who might be able to improve both the artistic and financial situation of the Académie Royale de Musique, which have simply put the opera in Paris. However, when he was offered the job, a number of female singers petitioned Marie Antoinette to prevent his being appointed because they did not want to work under a person of color. In order to save the queen from embarrassment, Saint-Georges withdrew his application, and no one was given the job, since he was the only qualified candidate in the running. Marie Antoinette was already an unpopular figure at this point, and dared not make further waves in this direction. However, right up until the French Revolution, she would often come to Saint-Georges' Le Concert Olympique performances. Saint-Georges' experience of prejudice unsurprisingly made him very receptive to the liberal ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity that fueled the French Revolution that began in 1789. As many musicians had done, Saint-Georges found brotherhood and liberty from the feudal confines of music in the Freemason society, and especially in Le Concert Olympique that he continued to direct until 1789. Louis-Philippe II, Duke of Orléans, was the Grand Master of Grand Orient de France, and he became Saint-Georges' patron and friend when he lived at the Duke's establishment at the Palais Royal, also incidentally the home of the opera in Paris, which was later called the birthplace of the French Revolution. Though an extremely wealthy cousin of King Louis XVI, Louis-Philippe II shared and promoted Saint-Georges' ideals and, and was instrumental as a Jacobin to push for cultural change, even to the point of renaming himself Philippe Egalité. 
His Enlightenment ideals also prompted him to convert the Palais Royal to the Palais Egalité, where, in theory, people of all classes were welcome. In the photos, Saint-Georges and Philippe are wearing the Freemason insignia, demonstrating their Enlightenment views. However, not even liberal ideology was created equal, and there were many viewpoints from extreme to moderate that were often heavily influenced by economic interests. With the influence of philosophers such as Voltaire, Rousseau, Diderot, and D'Alembert, on August 26, 1789, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen was adopted. The first point states that men are born and remain free and equal in rights. But racism, often based on financial concerns, still left in question who exactly was considered a man and a citizen. Saint-Georges was not in France when this document was established, but instead on the second of two trips that he made to England. With the abolitionist movement in full swing in Britain, Saint-Georges thought of settling in London where he was well received as both a musician and a fencer, and where recognition as a full human being seemed nearer in sight. There are differing reports on Saint-Georges' activity towards abolition, but it is known that Philippe Egalité's chief of staff, Jacques-Pierre Brousseau, sought Saint-Georges' assistance to establish Société des Amis des Noirs, as a step towards abolition in France. Brousseau was much more of an extremist than Philippe Illegalité and was emboldened by the activities and encouragement of William Wilberforce in England. This political cartoon depicts Saint-Georges boxing the dragon, symbolizing slavery. And indeed, he was attacked in real life in what some considered an assassination attempt to prevent his abolitionist activity initiatives during his second London trip. Also notice the figure in the background of the image wearing a dress and fighting the personage meant to be the Prince of Wales. This is the Mademoiselle de Homme, a transgender chevalier, spy, soldier, and diplomat from France who fought Saint-Georges in a fencing match on his first trip to London in 1787. Although it was never clearly reported who had won the match, the episode was immortalized in this painting by Alexander Auguste Robineau shortly after the event. As evident from this famous match, even though Saint-Georges had entertained a dancing injury to his Achilles heel in 1779, this did not stop him from maintaining himself as an athlete and engaging in battle. After his return to France, Saint-Georges became colonel of the Legion Saint-Georges in 1792, which was made up entirely of soldiers of color who were ready to fight for revolutionary causes. Already a popular figure, he proved to be an excellent leader and led his soldiers valiantly in their quest for justice and equality. Even though Saint-Georges had abandoned the noble signaling de in his name, Nevertheless, his chevalier status and his associations with many members of the nobility, including Marie Antoinette, led to his arrest without concrete charges in September 1793. Over a year later, he was released. However, it seemed he couldn't win, as his legion had been purposefully broken up, and despite his inspiring leadership, he was prevented from being reinstated as colonel and was eventually dismissed from the army in October of 1795. This is all thought to have had racist undertones, despite slavery having been abolished in the French colonies in February 1794, exactly 230 years ago this February. While details are scarce, Saint-Georges is recorded to have left independently for Saint-Domingue soon after this to fight in the Haitian Revolution that had been underway since 1791. He returned to France in 1797, where he would live out the rest of his days, 
devoted to his violin. Saint-Georges died in Paris on June 9, 1799, just five months before the end of the French Revolution. He never saw the formation of the French consulate, which was the government of the first French Republic. And neither did he witness France's reinstatement of slavery by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1802 as an attempt to remain financially viable in the Americas. Although Marie Antoinette had been beheaded, her legacy lived on in the popularity of cotton and its commodification made possible by the industrial revolutions contributions of the cotton mill and cotton gin. Despite his bigoted and backward return to slavery, Napoleon was forced to sell Louisiana to the United States in 1803, and Haitian independence was achieved in 1804. Finally, slavery was abolished for good in the French Empire in 1848. Nevertheless, decolonization is still an ongoing struggle as in the case of Guadeloupe, Saint-Georges' birthplace, which is still an overseas dominion of France, regardless of many attempts on the part of its people to regain autonomy. Thus ends this brief glance into the life and legacy of Joseph Boulogne, Chevalier Saint-Georges. Not only has he left us with beautiful and important music, but his significance as a chevalier pursuing justice and humanity is intricately woven into the fabric of history. His existence provides a missing link that fills out a narrative of both musical and cultural history. The constellation formed by his connection with so many other important figures changes the picture of history. In the words of Emile Smidak, in the person of the chevalier, a new age began that was to reject the myth of white superiority and move towards the truth of a common humanity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.